Good. Okay. So, um, yes. Um, well, the talk I, uh, the, the title I gave Sanfa was Navigating the Ups and Downs, um, the Ups and Downs of Life. Um, but since I started writing it, I didn't feel it was quite right. So I read it a little bit. And uh, now it's navigating the ups and downs of life and having your cake and eating it. Um, so <laughs> just because I like cake, I suppose. But anyway, so that's where it is. So, uh, so settle in. Maybe, uh, hopefully it's going to be useful. It may not be, but um, that's what we're going to get. So anyway. Um, the idea came about because I was listening to um, another Buddhist teacher from a different tradition giving a talk and he kind of did this quite interesting um, description of somebody's experience, um, particularly buying, buying a car, a te Tesla car and uh, the ups and downs of uh, buying that car and, and went on with that. But I decided not to follow that exactly and just really talk about the ups and downs. Firstly, talk about the ups and downs and how we navigate them. So we experience life as ups and downs. Yeah. We, in, when it, uh, we're at ease and things are, uh, are good, we call them ups. Yeah. When we find something difficult, we call these downs. Yeah. So life happens, we experience it as ups and downs. Experiences rise and fall away. There's nothing much we can do about them. Life, in a way, arises and falls away. But the ups feel good. It's what we think we want. That feeling of ease, of being, okay. Ups can be fun, even inspiring. When we feel good, we don't experience the downs. We think everything can be, will always be up. Our sense of self is reinforced. We can feel fulfilled in our jobs, our relationships, our meditation, our life, and we want it to continue. to keep feeling fulfilled in our life. The ups and downs, the ups are said to be like fragrant oil on skin or walking down a gentle slope. We just don't notice it. So close that we can see, we can't see that it won't last. Can't last. We're immune to the fact that they, the ups, won't last, can't last. Kenzo Rinpoche says this, it's said that good circumstances are more difficult to deal with than bad ones because they're more distracting. If you have whatever you wish for, wealth, a comfortable house, clothing, you should view it all as illusory like possessions obtained in a dream, rather than feeling compulsive attachment to it. If someone gets angry with you or threatens you, it's relatively easy in a way to meditate on patience, or if you feel sick, to cope with the sickness, since these things are causes of suffering, and suffering naturally reminds us of the Dharma. In this way, it's easier to integrate these difficult things in your path. But when things are going well and you feel happy, your mind accepts the situation without any difficulty. Like oil spread over your skin, attachment easily stays invisibly blended into the mind. It becomes part of your thoughts. Once such attachment to favorable circumstances is present, you become almost infatuated with your achievements, your fame, your wealth. There's something very difficult to get rid of. 
So that was Dilgo Kenzo Rinpoche. And so we try to keep, keep having the ups. Yeah. We try to engineer being up, feeling good. Try to have a great time, a new experience, a holiday, to find Mr. and Mrs. Perfect, to drive the best car, to have the best meditation, to be better, to be perfect, to be like the Buddha. There's always this trying to stabilize ourselves, to make our life the best, comfortable, stable, safe to hold on tightly. Downs are more difficult. Sometimes they're small. Sometimes things niggle, don't quite fit, feel not quite right. Other times the difficulties seem large, overwhelming, overpowering, insurmountable. And we respond by not wanting to feel, not wanting to experience, or to try and get rid of, wanting to move away from, to fix, to distract ourselves, avoid our being, our being with our difficulties. Often things are difficult because we want them to be different. We want this and we expect it to be like that and it isn't. We expect it to be like um, something has to be the right way. Someone has to be perfect, just right. We look for the right job, the right relationship, the right Buddhist center, the right Buddhist teacher, the right meditation. And when our experience doesn't match our expectations, how things should be, it's difficult. We feel let down. Expectations, it is said, as I was told just on Saturday, are resentments under construction. Expectations are resentments under construction. And we get lost. In the lost in the world where things aren't what they should be. Where, where if only I could get the right experience, live in the right house, have the right partner, enjoy the best meditation. We're let down by the world and our experience lets us down. This world of dissatisfaction or things not quite being good enough becomes our total experience or can become our total experience. In our moments of difficulty, that's all we encounter. We are, as it were, in them. That's all we are. We lose sight of the ups. We lose our perspective. And it's this feeling that it's difficult, that it's not right, that it's not as it should be. These feelings that we do not want, experiences that don't match our expectations. So we seek change. The world isn't right. It needs to be changed. We need to make change. And it seems that there's all there is. That's all there is. Difficulties, downs, disappointments. And nothing ever changes. Downs, however, are an opportunity. Yeah. They're an opportunity to explore. When we don't feel comfortable, there's an opportunity to learn. Not how do I get rid of this experience or not how do I change the external circumstances, but what am I feeling? Why do I not like feeling like this? Why am I responding like this? The external factors that cause our ups and downs are life. Ups and downs are not going to change. Experiences arise and fall away. But problems exist. 
when we want something to be a certain way and it isn't, when we invest in it being a particular outcome, when we grasp and we hold too tightly. And we try to navigate the ups and downs by orchestrating more ups, experiencing less downs. We try and cling on to, hold on to tightly the things that we like, even as they slip away into impermanence. We stop experiencing ourselves for fear of touching those uncomfortable, overwhelming, difficult experiences. Constantly trying to orchestrate the outside world, controlling, manipulating, so it meets our expectations, our likes and our wants. Or avoiding it, avoiding our disappointments. We feel our entitlement for how things should be, or our disdain and distress when things are not good enough. When she, he, they, the world, and how they should be. And we try to attain and have that particular experience, which we think will make us happy, try to own, possess the things we want to hold on to. On the radio, I think a week or so ago, I was listening to a radio program on positive thinking. It was entitled The Search for Lasting Happiness. And in it, there was this chap who had a formula. He'd been some big week in Google somewhere in the States and come back here. And he had this formula, um, which I'm not going to go into. But the program reminded me of the other side of the equation. Ultimately, in a binary world of there's the world out there and us in here, we can either try to adjust the world out there to suit us, or as in the world of positive thinking, to try and change the world in here. That is, to develop our thinking, our expectations, so that we align with how things are out there. I.e., we have this view that we need to either change the world or change our mind. In the world of positive thinking, we can manage our expectations, develop positive thinking, develop self-control and fortitude, all as a means of overcoming disappointments, destructive emotions, and thereby be happy. But because of that, sometimes we might just become a little overoccupied with me and my mental states, how I am. It's perhaps easy to see that Buddhism in this light as a way to be, to become happy. Yeah, up there, there's the Buddha, serene, happy, dwelling in bliss, at peace. And it's so easy, unconscious even, to want to attain that. All we have to do is the right thing, become the right person, have the right meditation, dwell in the right mental states, perfect ourselves in the image of the Buddha. It's actually, in a way, it's all too easy to employ those mental habits that we use developing to navigate the ups and downs of samsara and transpose them onto the way we practice Buddhism. But I think the Buddha proposes a different approach. It seems to be about navigating the ups and downs, but perhaps in a slightly different way. Perhaps just at this moment, it's also worth noting that this question of how we navigate the ups and downs was the same question that the Buddha himself sought to answer. How do we overcome our suffering? As beginners, we start with the idea that meditation is supposed to be perfect. 
or sorry, peaceful. If we feel peaceful, we conclude that we're doing things right. Soon enough, a disturbing thought or emotion erupts. This is the thought, I'm afraid, to be a problem. We don't like disturbances. We start with this dualistic preference that we like calm. We want smooth waters, not waves. When the waves come, we say we can't meditate or assume that we're not meditating correctly. But the waves keep coming anyway, always, just like the foam. When we relate to the waves, as threatening monsters or distractions, try to ignore them, push them away, we can apply certain mental techniques to subdue them, or we can pretend not to notice them. Deny their presence or get carried away with their flow. But there's no liberation in trying to get rid of the wave or of being thrown this way or that. If you examine your mind that is trying to get rid of disturbances, the waves, you'll discover that it's stuck on a problem, making a mountain out of a molehill. You can tell ourselves intellectually, these waves are essentially empty. We can play with the ideas and concepts that the wave is not really a monster. But in our hearts, we still feel the threat. And we inherently react to protect ourselves from it. This describes the first stage of working with our mind. In the next stage, we start to learn to be able to be with stay with our experience, noticing and being with the body, the body sensations, noticing and being with emotions, thoughts, sounds, what the mind takes hold of. The waves might still be disruptive or even terrifying, but sometimes we begin to glimpse the boundless expanse of water beneath the surface. And that gives us more confidence somehow to let it be. We're introduced to resting in this spacious, non-conceptual aspect of mind that transcends our limited, small, reactive self. Loosening our grasp, we see the picture a little bit more clearly. Instead of seeing something solid and fixed, an obstacle, with larger, more open perspective, we can see change another way. If we take a bit of space, let our shoulders relax, our mind expands a little bit, and we start to let go of the grip that makes us see just the fixedness. With a little perspective, more space, more room to see the bigger picture, we can start to see the process, process which does and can change. In the Tibetan tradition, the nature of awareness, mind, has three inseparable qualities. Openness, which you can also describe as spaciousness. Clarity, which kind of relates to awareness and our ability to be clear and to differentiate, and sensitivity, a sense of responsiveness or well being. The spacious, non conceptual aspect of mind, of our being, consists of these three inseparable qualities openness, clarity, sensitivity. As we start to explore and to grow, in our practice, we start to experience more often the sense of a bigger, freer, more open dimension of ourselves. 
is also the chattering mind. Thoughts, feelings, ideas, emotions arise. But we do not yet, and we do not yet see these as waves. But our bigger perspective has just become a little bit bigger. Our perspective has just become a little bit bigger than the waves. Our personal stories of fear and loss, of rejection, of self-recrimination are still there, but they do not pervade every space in our head. Our fixed, limited mind is loosened a little, and we start to realize that our own version of reality exists within a part of ourselves that can be bigger, open, spacious, kind, clear. As we stumble upon, develop, explore this other dimension of ourself, those same everyday stories do not disturb us as much. We can let go of them more easily. We begin to think, oh, there's a wave forming on the surface of my mind, or there's a monster in my head, no problem. We can start to be with our experience, acknowledge the problem without reacting to it. We see it, perhaps even learn to feel it, but are not now overwhelmed by it. The more we rest in, connect in to the recognition of that spacious open dimension, the more we embody the wisdom of emptiness. The less impact the disturbances have, the wave is there, but now sometimes we can experience it as just a tiny moment, just a tiny movement in the vastness of the ocean. When we connect in to spacious awareness, then we can accommodate whatever arises. The big waves of loved ones dying, relationships ending, the ripples of crashing computers and delayed flights, lockdown. When we learn to trust, place our confidence in that bigger, more spacious aspect of our being, as we experience ourselves, our openness, our clarity, our sensitivity. We understand our understanding of emptiness drops from the intellectual head to the experiential, feeling in the heart. But still, still, we can get stuck on the surface of the waves and lose touch with the ocean. The nature of meditation is to experience. Yeah. Experience both the objects and the nature of our mind. There's this learning to be with, to stay with, to focus on this moment. Experiencing our experience in our bodies experiencing our mind objects, thoughts, images, feelings, learning to be with, stay with each moment, developing a sensitivity to ourselves so that we can be fully with, aware of each moment more deeply. We practice this learning, this ability to come back, to be fully present, aware, sensitive to our experience. We practice, being present, staying with, resting in our current experience. And this all happens within a relaxed, open, spacious dimension of mind. We learn to let go of holding tightly. We learn to open, to expand, to feel the weight of the body, the connection with the ground. We sit being aware with a wider sense of space, of openness. We develop a sense of perspective that our mind, our awareness is as big as the ocean, as vast as an open and multi-directional 
as the clear blue sky. And the objects of our experience sit within it, arising, falling away, changing, arising, falling away. Learning not to hold tightly, but not drifting over our experience, we sit alive and alert, attentive and present within a spacious awareness, receptive with delight, aware of being, aware we practice, being in space, in silence, within which we witness the arising and falling away. Awareness is the essence of our being, is an inherent part of our consciousness. And yet sometimes, perhaps, we often feel unaware or partly aware. Most of the time, we're not fully aware of our experience. Most of the time, we're not very aware of ourselves. This, of course, is a dualistic framework with which we experience the ups and downs, becoming more aware of out there, becoming more aware of in here. Both of these are fundamentally important aspects of awareness. But ultimately, perhaps fundamentally, what's more important is to become aware of being aware. To be aware of our awareness. It's within our reach all the time. And yet most of us do not recognize that our awareness is our greatest treasure, that we have already have it, we, that we already have it, but don't know it. And that's just because we're caught in this dual framework of just seeing the our experience, the out there or experience me, the in here. As we practice over time, something very subtle is happening. No longer do we just sit down to look at the contents of our mind. No longer do we look to focus on our feelings, our experiences, our thoughts and our ideas to change them or to respond to them. In the third stage, we train ourselves just to rest in the open dimension, in openness, clarity, sensitivity, opening up to those qualities of an eight awareness. If we identify with anything, we identify with awareness itself, mind, awareness, vast, and spacious, clear and sensitive, giving us a sense of being seated within, resting within the spacious nature of our being. The objects of our attention rise and fall, arising and falling within openness, within spacious awareness. Worrying about things, our unhappiness, comes from focusing on the contents of our mind. Our unhappiness comes from focusing on the contents of our mind. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas. Thoughts about the past, the future, what should be, loss and gain. Our experiences and our responses. Now we turn away from mind objects and toward the qualities of awareness itself. We dwell in, reside in, align ourselves with, trust, just be, aware, open, clear, sensitive, Instead of being caught in the polarity of self and other, we turn towards our own well-being, dwelling in, residing in, 
aligning ourselves to our own inner innate well-being. Being awareness, fully present, experiencing openness, clarity, sensitivity. My Asanga, 4th century, one of the most perhaps important spiritual figures of Mahayana Buddhism, has this to say, space, whose nature is free of concepts, encompasses everything. Likewise, the stainless expanse of mind's true nature permeates all being. Awareness is sometimes just spaciousness, just the open dimension. When we stop trying to make the surface calm and acknowledge that the very nature of the ocean of mind is change, we begin, begin to experience freedom. We're limited, we're liberated from the suffering by correctly perceiving things as they are. This means that we have the insight and the experience to know that our minds are much vaster than we think they are. The over-identification of the object of our attention is gone. The over-identification attachment to our thoughts and feelings, our body sensations is gone. Our practice becomes resting in our being. In that spacious, open awareness, no waves stay the same shape, all crest and fall. Let them be. Let it pass. We become bigger than the thought, bigger than the emotion. Everything is always in flux. Letting it be, we simply allow for inherent motion. We notice preference, desire. Chasing after them blocks the flow. It's not about trying to have a particular kind of experience. It's not about not thinking. It's not about pushing anything away. It's not about being with. It is about perhaps being with, being in your experience as fully and deeply as you can. And that can be practiced in meditation or in our daily routine outside meditation. As our mind stabilizes, the wave, if it appears, no longer appears as a problem something to be fixed, to got rid of, ignored. It's still a wave, big or small, but we don't get stuck in it. Comfortable and at ease, resting in the ocean itself, familiar with the full expanse of the ocean itself, even the biggest waves no longer bother us. This is how we can now experience our thoughts and emotions even those we have spent our lives trying to be free of. Every moment of mind object, every emotional reaction, is just a wave in the vast ocean of the mind and arising with an awareness, stable in awareness, not blowing this way or that. The ups and downs arise, fall, occur, but our identification is now with the ocean. So simple, because it is so simple. Difficult, because it means transforming our way of being in the world, changing our mind habit, integrating our being, purifying our heart. Becoming fully aware 
we become fully into relationship with ourselves and our experience of the world. Content, alive, engaged. It is said that we dance, play, delight in this world of appearances. Good. Ah. Very good. So I think what we'll do, we've got about 10 minutes. So let's go back if we can.